Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Uriah Donaldson. Uh, we'll get this show on the road. Um, eight o'clock, some of us have been up for longer than others, and some are just kind of um, late nine people, like my wife, who's like, eight o'clock, I hate that time of morning. Um, anyways, so this is a joint uh, presentation between uh, myself, representing resource compliance, and some fast, fantastic regulators from Kern County Environmental Health. <laughs> we have Mark right here first, and then Chad, and then Dan Starkey, who actually leads the CalArt program, I believe. That's what you do, right? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> mm, we've, mm, I've actually had the privilege of working with these guys for some time, um, so it's a, a privilege to do this joint presentation together. Um, want to draw your attention to a couple quick things. Uh, first off, we do, there is a, a link at the top of this presentation. So if you have a, a smartphone or an internet enabled device, you can open up a browser, uh, Safari, Google Chrome, something like that, and just type that URL in, and you can type in your questions. Um, and then near the end time allowing, uh, we will, um, I'll monitor those questions, and then we will run through them as quickly as we can at the end of the presentation, because we have a lot of content to get through today, um, and, and don't want to get sidetracked interacting with various questions throughout the presentation. So you can just type in your questions. If you don't have a smartphone or an internet-enabled device, then find an internet-enabled device buddy and have them type your question in. Um, with that said, just a, a few <coughs> introductions again. So the four of us, we will be um, doing four different sections in this presentation. Um, so the, the Coupa form or the CalArp Coupa form, I'm not sure how, what it's actually called, but they set for actual guidelines or um, learning objectives for this presentation. So it's something that I believe they do every, every conference. Um, and the, so we've split these up between the four of us. Um, so just, I'm not gonna read through these, but they are um, objectives that are set out by um, this class in particular. So I don't know if you guys have to get like certain for your RH, REHS or certain certifications. I don't know if this class is one thing that works towards that, something like that. I don't know. I'm not a regulator, so, but these objectives have been set out, so we're going to do our best to meet these learning objectives. So Mark gets the ones regarding um, hazard assessment, offsite consequence analysis, and uh, completeness reviews. Then Chad and myself will divvy up the program or the prevention program elements of CalARP, um, <coughs> process safety information, PHA, training, MOC, things of that nature. And then rounding out the team is veteran inspector Dan Starkey. He'll be um, walking through some emergency response elements as well as enforcement. And he's got a couple case studies and stories to share with you from his vast experience in doing those sorts of things. So that's where we're going. That's what we're doing this morning. And so uh, just laying the groundwork, oh, by the way, so just kind of throughout the last objective is that we're talking about different common um, processes that are regulated, such as ammonia um, or refineries or chlorine, things of like that. That'll be kind of scattered throughout our presentation in references and allusions um, and illustrations. So laying the groundwork um, here at the beginning to talk through this last um, learning objective, understanding of the substances regulated under CalARP, including threshold determinations and exemptions. The big idea, how do you know if a facility um, or the technical term stationary source, which we'll define here in a minute, is, um, is regulated by CalARP? How do you know if you're actually a CalARP facility. So what are thresholds? Um, what are these terms like process and facility and stationary source? So let's talk through, um, there's no point, you can't, you're not going to regulate a facility that's not even subject to the regulation. So how is that, how does the facility become subject? So out of, we call this CalARP applicability, um, and it reads this way, an owner or operator of a stationary source, we'll define that in a minute, that has more than a threshold quantity of a regulated substance in a process as determined under the RMP and or CalARP must comply with the requirements of the RMP or the CalARP regulation. Um, in our case, we're talking specifically CalARP. So defining some of these things, if you, um, CalARP does have a fantastic guidance document um, that walks through some of these things. So if you're a, a newer regulator to this, um, to this field, if you will, of regulation, then the guidance document is definitely something that you want to have available to yourself that you've read through and have consulted. Um, it's a fantastic place to start. And so a stationary source is defined um, simply as a facility 
with more than a threshold quantity of a regulated substance. So um, big idea, there is a, a chart, I'm sure that you can't fully read that or see that, so this is a screenshot out of the, the guidance document. But it shows several different examples of what stationary sources might be. Namely, if you have um, like one facility that has like the, the last one down here, if you've got a facility that has maybe a road between it and if they're different facilities or if they're owned by the same company, <coughs> um, how do you know if it's just one program that you develop or if you, have to, if, if you have to develop multiple programs? So there's varying different scenarios that can take place. We're not gonna go through all of them, but I namely just wanna point you towards the CalARP guidance document and you can study this chart for yourself. So when you're doing inspections or if you're an end user and you're wondering, do I need to submit one program? Do I need to submit two programs? How does this apply to me? The CalARP guidance document can answer those questions for you. Uh, process is a fancy word for where the regulated substance, where the ammonia, where the sulfur dioxide, where the chlorine, where that hazard material is stored. So process means, um, and furthermore, any activity involving a regulated substance, including the use, the storage, manufacturing, handling, or on-site movement of sub substances or combination of these activities. For the purpose of, the de of this definition, any group of vessels, so this is important when we're talking about like refrigeration systems, for example, um, any group of vessels that are interconnected, um, or if these vessels are separate, um, but they're located such that the regulated substance could be involved in the potential release um, would be considered a single process. So what does that mean? Um, if you have, I come across this a lot, if your, say, process or your regulated substance is sulfur dioxide and you have, you're storing a number of um, compressed cylinders in one location over here, but then you have another storage of compressed cylinders maybe 15 feet away. Um, you would consider that a single process. If, however, you have one location of compressed cylinders here and then another storage location on the other side of your facility, you would consider that two processes because the release of one of them and, and one process is not going to affect the ones all the way on the other side of the facility. So that would be a simple example of how do we define process. If you have, say, a refrigeration system and all the vessels and, and everything is connected by piping, but it's going all throughout the facility, that's considered a single process because they're interconnected. So those are just a couple quick examples of how we define process, but whatever the regulated substance is stored or handled or manufactured, that is what your process is. So depending on your application, um, one single CalArt program could have multiple <coughs> processes. Um, so again, if you're a, an end user, or if you're regulating or inspecting a facility, um, you don't have to develop multiple programs if you have multiple processes. You can have multiple processes with one single CalArp program. Um, so how do we define this again? In the CalArp document, there's, or a guidance document, there is some helpful flow charts in determining if you're subject um, to CalArp. I'm not going to detail to go through that one, but this one is more important. CalARP, as I'm sure you're aware, um, if not, then it's good that you're in this class, um, has multiple program levels, program one, program two, and program three. And so how do, we, how do you decide or how do you determine what program level applies to you? Again, there is a helpful flow chart to determine that. Um, if you're a program one, simply, if you follow the ones here on the left, um, if your offsite consequence analysis analysis um, or hazard assessment, which is something Mark will be talking about here in a minute. If that reaches, your worst case scenario reaches off-site receptors, um, then you're not going to be a program one. But if, you're, if your regulated substance is, say, like a powder or something, where if it was released, it's not going to go off-site, then you could be um, possibly a program one facility because that's not going off-site. Um, how do you determine between program two and program three? If your regulated substance, say for example like ammonia, is also subject to OSHA's standard, um, then you're automatically a program three. Um, that's usually the key determining factor whether or not you're a program two or program three is if you're subject to PSM. However, um, as a CUPA, a facility that is maybe actually a program two, say it's an ammonia facility that's not subject to o OSHA PSM, 
Um, but as a Coupa, if you determine that they are a higher risk for a variety of reasons, um, you can require them to be a program or in implement a program three CalARP program. Um, so that is something that is within your jurisdiction. Um, you've got to make a good case for that. You can't just say off a whim, oh, I want you to be a program three just because you want it. So there needs to be some good reasoning and logic behind that decision making process. Um, and then finally, so we talk about thresholds. Um, so what does that mean? In the CalARP law in table one, um, there's, there's actually a couple different tables. There's one for the, the federal RMP regulation and then there's also the CalARP table. Um, <clears throat> table one here is for the, the, federal, um, the federal thresholds because you'll notice up here, like for ammonia, the threshold is 10,000 pounds. For um, an aqueous ammonia solution, we have 20,000 pounds. CalARP has an, their own table as well in the document, and many of these thresholds are lower. Um, so, for example, ammonia is 500 pounds, um, as well as sulfur dioxide. Whereas in the table one for the federal RMP, sulfur dioxide is 5,000 pounds, I believe. Um, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. And then OSHA is 100 or 1,500. So, anyways, for CalARP, um, if you want to, if you're look, if your facility has um, chemicals on site and you're not sure if they're supposed to be subject to CalARP or not, um, you can easily look up the, um, the chemical in the table in the CalARP regulation and see what the threshold quantity is. So that's a, a pretty simple process to determine um, if, they, if they're over the threshold or not. With that said, um, I'm going to turn over the mic to my friend Mark Rodriguez who's going to talk about hazard assessments and off-site consequence analysis. There's the clicker. Center button here? Mm, the one on the yeah, the one on the right. Okay. Center button. Gotta figure out how to work these things. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Rodriguez. Again, I'm with Kern County. Um, real quick, a kind of show of fingers. How many times do you guys think it, um, coordination is referenced in the program, as far as in sections? How many sections do you guys think it's referenced? One, two, three, four, and more than likely people only refer to or only think about um, emergency evacuation. It's referenced 11, in 11 different sections throughout the program. A third of those being in emergency response. Um, <coughs> basically, that is probably one of the most key elements of ensuring that a uh, program is, is both written and implemented um, to meet the requirements of the regulation. Uh, speaking on, prior to coming with Kern County a couple years back, I was in industry. And on that side of things, I could tell you one of the biggest benefits I had was uh, working with the local Coopas in determining which course of action I was gonna take, you know, as far as um, how I was gonna design, um, or I was gonna design, but how to implement certain changes that we were gonna make. Um, In a lot of those cases, they would come to us with the, with our, uh, with their recommendations, and we would implement those, and there would be no harm, no foul as far as uh, making updated, updated changes that maybe we never looked at before. Um, as long as we came to them first, most of the time they were fine with not giving us a violation. I kind of use the same practice now, and I always go by if. As a regulator, we should be teaching first rather than uh, enforcement. And unless we go out there and we see the same thing over and over again, or if we're catching something that's outright um, complete violation of what we're looking for. Um, <coughs> let's see here. Oh, sorry. Getting... So as far as complete... Uh, Compliance review goes, most of the compliance review sections comes down to three categories, and I think a lot of us can um, can agree that some of these are going to be similar. Um, for industry, the uh, compliance audits are conducted every three years, and uh, they must be uh, conducted by at least one person knowledgeable in the process. Um, as far as for regulators, we have both in audits and we have inspections. 
there's quite a bit of debate as far as what's the difference between those two. In most cases, we can all pretty much say that an audit and an inspection are very similar. Uh, we look at the same things in both of them. Um, one of the biggest differences on that is that um, audits in our program, in Kern County's program, they produce um, deficiencies rather than violations, whereas an inspection, which is done more frequently, will produce violations. Um, the deficiencies, you have a little bit more time, more, uh, more, um, what's the <laughs> thing I'm looking for? Um, uh, it's a more structured approach and you have more, uh, Dan, what's the word I'm looking for? I know deficiencies. They have more of a, a, uh, <laughs> a uh, timetable to come in, come to come into compliance whereas uh, with the inspections they're 30 days um, let me see another approach looking at uh, the differences between audits and inspections is audits this is just an approach um, it's not necessarily the way that it is looked at but uh, inspections are uh, tend to be more on a equipment based um, inspection, you're going to look at more of the equipment rather than the program, and audits will look at more of the programs. Um, both of them will look for unsafe acts. Did that go backwards? I think it did. Okay. That's backwards. And again, uh, inspections tend to be more frequent. Uh, audits tend to be more on the timetable of whenever needed or on the three-year um, uh, in, uh, frequency and then uh, inspections tend to produce violations and audits tend to produce deficiencies. Um, inspections can be classified in some cases as more of a snapshot of what's going on within that facility at the time and then audits are more of a comprehensive uh, view of what that, uh, what's going on with those programs. Um, Hazard assessments and offsite consequence analysis. So, you guys have heard this pretty much all week long. Worst case release scenario is defined as a hypothetical analysis of what is the largest release of a regulated substance <coughs> through a pipeline or a vessel at any given point. So, how far can you reach with that release? Um, and that is used to determine what program you're going to be in. Like Uriah said, that's kind of a hard fast rule. It doesn't necessarily mean that is going to be what determines your program. Uh, there's a couple of different factors that will go into that. It's your offsite consequence, your, um, your sensitive receptors, plus your history or what um, are your hazard level. And uh, that would be up to the um, COOPA to determine as well. Um, in order to determine offsite consequence, we're going to look at wind speed and the stability. Uh, ambient temperature and humidity, uh, height of release, topography, and the temperature. <coughs> um, there is, actually I think I'm going to get into, and then we're also going to look at the endpoints. Um, there are some modeling software that you can use to determine this information, and uh, we'll, I'll look at that in just a second, but a couple, this is one of the modeling softwares called Marplot. Um, one of the things I like about this one, what's really good is, you can actually put in where, let me see if I can get this thing. You can actually put in a center point, put in your radius, and it'll shade it out nice for you. Um, this will also go and attach to Aloha, which will put a, more of a plume model, which will uh, elongate it and put it wherever the wind direction would be. Um, but also, it has a nice little section here with these people here that'll automatically give you the population based off the latest census. So that is also a um, requirement within your uh, hazard analysis is, or hazard assessment, which is to um, include your population. So rather than using the EPA's rule or trying to look up the uh, census yourself and determine that population, this will do it for you. <coughs> Uh, alternative release scenarios. So the alternative release scenario 
is going to be your most likely release, the most likely release that will reach an off-site consequence. Um, a lot of the times it, what we'll see is, oh, they'll put a 100-pound leak out of a valve packing. It doesn't go off-site. It doesn't uh, reach any t kind of uh, off-site consequence. What we're looking for is what's your most common release that'll be an off-site consequence um, or reach public receptor. The only way to get out of that is if no such scenario exists. If you can't reach it by any means necessary, then you go by whatever you can, uh, whatever your most common release would be and how far that would be. Um, Defining off-site impacts in the po to the population, what we're going to look at is going to be residents, schools, hospitals, et cetera, parks, um, any environmental impacts, so rivers, lakes, um, national parks, uh, any kind of uh, government um, uh, area or gathering. Um, And as far as the review for these, these are done every five years uh, with a uh, RMP, well, they're due every five years. Don't get confused with uh, OSHA PSM. OSHA PSM is also every five years, but a lot of people make the mistake of if they go and submit through the online um, OSHA PSM website, I mean, not, not OSHA PSM, um, EPA's website, excuse me, <laughs> um, that they think that they're uh, going to be su that's sufficient enough uh, to submit to the Coupa. That is not the case because the EPA doesn't send us those in that information. So you got to report to the uh, local Coupa as well in order to meet that requirement. Um, if you make an update to the RMP, uh, that also needs to be uh, submitted to the Coupa within six months. So some of the information that needs to be in your hazard assessment uh, for the documentation. You've got to have a good description of the release, the vessel, the pipeline, whatever, is, whatever this, uh, this release is modeled off of, the substance you selected, so your process chemical, and any uh, parameters that were used um, in order to basically give a reason why you came up with that determination. So. Some of the modeling software that you can use that will kind of help prove that is going to be R, uh, RMP Comp from the EPA's website. And then you can use uh, Aloha, which is Aerial Location hazard, uh, Hazardous Atmospheres. That's going to give that elongated, elongated plume as far as uh, giving you your endpoint distance. But that's going to be based off of wind direction and everything like that. Um, but that's part of the whole cameo suite, which is Aloha, that MAR plot that I showed earlier. And uh, what's the other one on Aloha, MAR plot, and cameo, um, which cameo will give you your uh, technical information on that chemical. So this, the weight and uh, that uh, those items. So that. Actually, that would be back to Uriah. Mm, thank you, Mark. And so section two, we're going to be going through the, um, actually, there was a couple questions that came in that I'm just going to answer right now rather than the end. One of you asked <coughs> if these, this presentation will be available for download. Um, there was a, a couple last modifications that were made um, here this week, so that's why it was not uploaded to the conference after this presentation is done at um, 9.45. Um, these slides will be uploaded so you can download them from them. Or if you want to grab one of our email addresses, I'm more than happy to um, email it to you as well. So section two is when we're going to be going through the actual prevention program elements. Um, part of this is in the, um, one of the learning objectives is to understand the differences between program two and program three, um, since <coughs> those are the two most common programs, I think, that you oftentimes um, inspect or that facilities um, have that their processes are um, applied to. So while there's a number of nuances between program two and program three when you read them, um, the goal of, of my section 
this, or my goal in this section here is to actually demonstrate to you that while yes, um, there are many um, different, can be many different nuances, actually in implementation in real life, um, when a facility is doing this or doing it right, uh, there isn't really enough difference to make a difference, to say it that way. There isn't really enough difference in the regulation to make a difference in actual implementation. Yes, um, the only real difference that you might see is in their actual policies. Um, so let me demonstrate that to you, what I, what I actually mean by that. Um, right here is a table that shows you the different prevention program elements between program two and program three, and you can see right off the bat that program three has a lot more elements. When we get into this, however, we'll notice that all of the elements that are missing in program two, um, that are not explicitly there, for example, like number one, management of change, they show up in other elements of the program two, um, of a CalArt program two. So for example, management of change is not a specific prevention program element, but when you read the program two elements, such as safety information, it says safety information must be updated when a change occurs. That's the language <coughs> of management of change. Or operating procedures must be updated when a change occurs. So what's happened when, in the writing of the CalArp regulation, um, yes, program two is missing uh, some of the prevention program elements, but um, some of the basic language still shows up in program level two. So as a consultant, um, I generally recommend that for program two facilities, okay, you don't actually, you're not actually required to have a management of change procedure or policy. However, what is the best way to manage changes if you do an expansion project or something that might require an MOC? Just do an MOC. <laughs> like the best way to make sure that your safety information is updated properly, that your operating procedures are updated properly, that all the all employees that need to be trained are trained properly. The best way to ensure that is to do some sort of simplified management of change type documentation. So you could steal a MOC checklist from a program three um, and use it for your program two process. Uh, same thing with pre-startup safety review. Again, that's not an element that is explicitly required in program two. Um, however, again, the elements in PSSR for program three require that you update your safety or your process safety information and that um, employees are trained appropriately. And so again, we still find that same language in program two. Furthermore, contractors, um, while there's not a specific contractor prevention program element in program two, we do find a new sentence in program two under the maintenance section, which says owners must ensure that every contractor is trained to perform maintenance procedures. That's the same language that we find in program three contractor element. So again, while you're not required to have a contractor policy or procedure, um, you're still required to ensure that your contractors are trained to perform um, the tasks that you've hired them to perform. So again, as a consultant, um, I recommend the best way to do that is to still have some sort of contractor qualification type form um, and requesting and making sure that you have that type of documentation on file. Employee participation is it once again another element that is not explicitly in program two, but um, once again, we read in program two under the hazard review section, which is akin to the process hazard analysis section, um, that the hazard review shall be performed by a team familiar with process operations, shall include a, at least one person who has experience and knowledge in the process. That's employee participation, that employees are participating in the development or um, the actual um, elements of a PHA or a hazard review. So once again, um, this is simply just to demonstrate to you that yes, program two has, is missing some of the prevention program elements, but the essence of those elements is still um, in the language of the required program two elements. Uh, finally, um, the one that actually doesn't have any language anywhere would be hot work permits, um, but that's still required by OSHA. So for us end user industry folk, it's still there anyways. <laughs> so you gotta have your hot work permits regardless if it's required by CalArt Program 2 or not. Um, so big idea, um, yes, we could. I could go through and show you the actual 
um, nuances and differences between program two and program three. And while um, that is important, particularly if there was an incident or an accident and we're doing litigation and we're now in the courts and stuff, that's when words really do matter. Um, so it's important not to just neglect those things. But again, for, for the purpose of this um, presentation and the time that we have, I still want to show you that the intention of the CalArt program, um, accidental release pr program, is that facilities run safe. And so just because if you're an end user and you are not subject to program three, um, it's still in your best interest um, in running a safe program to whether you have formal policies and procedures or if you just do it in practice to still implement things like making sure your contractors are trained and you're hiring good contractors to make sure that your employees are participating in the program to make sure that if you do expansion projects that all the documentation that is necessary gets updated and some of the best ways to do that as a program to facility is just to borrow some of the checklists that you might use as a program three facility. So with that said, getting into the actual program, prevention program elements now, um, we'll be going through the program three elements um, to make sure that we cover all the bases. And I'm gonna do the first couple here and then I'll hand it over to uh, my friend Chad to take over the, the remaining elements. So process safety information, <clears throat> this is um, what we might call the bedrock or the foundation of a good CalArt program. This is gonna be your technical information um, about the process. Um, these are the elements that are required. Um, so if you read your CALIP regulation, these are the, um, the 14 elements that are required in PSI. Um, it doesn't actually say an MS or an SDS sheet, but the easiest way to comply with the first point is simply have an SDS sheet of your CalArp chemical. So if it's ammonia, get something from Hill Brothers. If it's SO2 and you're in California, um, basically that's Snowden. Um, although they don't always provide stuff all the time, but they've gotten pretty good in training um, and some things. Stop talking, Uriah. So get an SDS sheet of your um, CalArp chemical. Block flow diagram, that is basically a, a one-page document that shows the flow of the process. So if you're a SO2 chemical or a, a chlorine facility, um, say like at a potato packing or a potato shed where you're injecting chlorine into water for like chlorinated water to wash potatoes, your block flow diagram is simply gonna say um, the chemical comes on site, we inject the chemical into the water, there might be a couple of things that you include in between there, but a very simplified process of um, how, how the chemical is being used, um, is it a closed loop system like ammonia where the the chemical is in the process and it never leaves, or is it something like chlorine or SO2 that you're actually using and then um, empty containers are taken away? So uh, it doesn't need to be more complicated. It really shouldn't be more than one page for a block flow. Process chemistry, um, I don't need to go through all of these in detail. Uh, max intent and inventory, just that you wanna um, document how much you're gonna have on site an important one, a couple ones just to, to talk about, PNIDs um, are important particularly for more complex um, systems like refrigeration or refineries that you're dealing with. Um, PNIDs for those types of systems are incredibly important um, to map out all the different equipment and piping and valves and safety systems and things of that nature. Um, so understanding difference between hazard review and process hazard analysis. This is again the learning objective set forth by, um, by the forum. So hazard review is the name that's given under program level two. Um, process hazard analysis is the name that is given under program level three. And again, while there are um, some subtle differences, uh, for all intents and purposes, it's uh, my opinion that generally they're done mostly the same. They're done enough the same that the small little differences for the sake of this presentation um, are not as important. So what are the big ideas that you need to take away as either an end user or as a regulator if you're inspecting? Um, what are the things that you need to know for a, a PHA that need, to, that need to be there? So rather than talking about kind of the small differences, let's talk about what actually needs to be there for whether it's program two or program three. Um, there are a number of different methodologies that can be used um, that are approved methodologies um, that I do not have listed up here. 
Um, and the reason for that is because they're not nearly as prevalent or used. The most common ones that you're going to come across are going to be a what-if checklist or checklist um, or a variation of that or HAZOP. Those are going to be the most prominent PHA methodologies that you will see out there um, for the majority of systems that um, you will be either you as an end user or you will, as a, as a Coupa regulator, will be inspecting. Um, I'm not very experienced in refineries, um, but I think that oftentimes refineries will use other methodologies like fault tree analysis sometimes or some of the more complex methodologies. Um, but again, for most of you, you're not going to be dealing with those. So what if checklist and HAZOP are the two um, that I believe are, are most prominent. The content of a PHA, it's important that if you're reviewing a PHA or if you're performing a PHA as an end user, um, that all of this information or content needs to be a part of that study and that report. Namely, you need to be considering the various hazards that your process poses, the hazards of the chemical itself, the hazards of the various equipment that is being used. Um, you need to make sure that what sort of controls are in place. So I like to say it this way, um, the big point of a PHA is to say, what could go wrong here, and what do we have in place to make sure it doesn't go wrong? That's the big idea. Um, if we don't lose focus of that while doing a PHA, then it won't be a, a pencil whipping type exercise, but you'll actually be looking at what really could go wrong here, what, really, what type of accidents really could occur or have occurred at other um, facilities like mine or at the specific facility where you're studying, and what do we have in place to make sure that it doesn't go wrong, the controls. Um, a PHA also needs to consider those, so when asking the question, what could go wrong here, we're asking the question, like, how bad would it actually be? What are the consequences of that failure? Are we talking, like, um, downed equipment, lost product, or are we talking injury to employees or fatality? Like, how bad is it really going to be? Facility siting, um, that is a fancy word for how does the location of the process or the location of the regulated substance um, affect things around it. So are you next to a school? Um, is the process where the, the hazardous um, chemical is kept, is that close to where employees work, for example? Um, so facility siting is where the, is talking about what um, the, the regulated substance, um, how close is it to other things that it might affect. Human factors, you need to be considering things like um, are employees overworked? Are they going to be tired? Do we have appropriate shifts and backup personnel? Are they trained properly? Things of that nature. And then finally, because we're in California, um, seismic assessments or um, external, external events, um, but specifically seismic assessment. Now, depending on what county you're in, um, there might be a different implementation for this. Again, if you're an end user or if you're a Coupa, um, some counties require a full-on seismic assessment performed by like an engineer, um, others do not, but nonetheless a PHA needs to include seismic assessment of some type. Uh, who needs to be a part of the PHA? So the team needs to have personnel that participate, that have expertise in engineering. Um, that does not necessarily mean that someone has to be a licensed engineer. Um, so that's not what that says. What it does mean though is that someone needs to have some sort of expertise in engineering. So maybe that's um, background or education like a bachelor's degree or it could be a license um, or it could be on the job training in engineering and various classes and um, professional certifications. So but some sort of engineering expertise needs to be a part of the team. Uh, operations means uh, someone that has expertise in the process being studied. So again if it's a refrigeration system uh, someone that is either the refrigeration operator or a contractor, technician, um, or someone that has expertise in how the process works, um, that they know about the equipment and what the equipment functions and how it's supposed to function and things of that nature. Furthermore, um, this is somewhat commonsensical, but we write it down because not everyone always follows common sense. Uh, someone needs to have an understanding and expertise in the methodology that's being used. So if you're performing a PHA and you're gonna be using the HAZOP methodology, but no one on your team has ever done a HAZOP study before, that's not okay. <laughs> so someone needs to know how the methodology actually works. So for example, I could never lead a fault tree analysis 
uh, PHA because I have no expertise in the methodology of fault tree analysis. I do, however, have participated in probably 100 or so what if checklists. So I have plenty of experience in that methodology. Um, and then process specific knowledge. So notice though that process specific knowledge um, isn't necessarily operations, but oftentimes those two do go together. The person that has um, knowledge of the specific process is also the person that has the same knowledge for operations. But that could be different. For example, you could have someone that has knowledge specific to the facility and the process being studied, but they don't have a lot of background. Um, or again, I think refrigeration is kind of my default. You have someone that monitors the system, but they don't have a lot of expertise in um, doing maintenance or equipment rebuilds or things like that. So it could be necessary to have a contractor also participate that fulfills the operations um, node there and then an employee fulfills the process specific knowledge. So those are the things that need to be on the team or the people that need to be on the team. That could be, um, yeah. Report and findings, a PHA does need to have an actual written report. Um, so it is needs to be an actual document, whether that's electronically kept or hard copy, um, but it needs to be a written report that is kept for the life of the process. So every PHA that is done at a facility for a specific process, you can never get rid of it. So for end users, if you buy a facility, um, previous PHAs that were done under previous ownership, you inherit them. So if they did a PHA that had a number of recommendations that are not completed and you buy that facility, you have now inherited those recommendations. So something that you need to be aware of. Um, so the facility, the PHA stays with the process itself for the life of the process. Um, those recommendations are supposed to be resolved within at least a two and a half year time period. That's what the CalArp regulation says. Um, but more importantly, that timetable needs to be agreed upon with the local Coupa. So you Coupas or you regulators, this is where um, you do have participation and say in um, how quickly or what sort of timetable recommendations need to be resolved in. You could say um, a year or you could say two and a half years is fine with us, but that's where you need to coordinate with the facilities within your jurisdiction so that they know what the timetable is for recommendations in your jurisdiction. With that said, um, I'm going to hand the clicker over to Chad to finish out the remaining um, prevention program elements. And again, um, if you have questions as we're going along, you can type them in and we'll do those at the end. Again, my name is Chad San Juan and I'll be continuing the discussion on understanding the CalArt program elements, specifically on program three, just because it is more stringent, but then I will highlight the differences and similarities uh, throughout the elements. So uh, breaking it down on operating procedures, uh, essentially operating procedures is the, I guess you could say like the instructions for operating your process. It is also considered a, I guess the foundation for your training as well. The main categories that need to be within or discussed within your operating procedures are operating phases, operating limits, safety and health considerations, and safety systems and their functions. Categories one and two are directly discussed within program two and in program three. Program categories three and four are further expanded in program three, but can be um, still required in program two um, if it is essential for safely, um, for you know, conducting safe activities for the process. There are various phases that need to be discussed within your operating uh, procedures. Your overall operating procedures, the complexity of your operating procedures will be based on the complexity of your process. I've seen operating procedures that was suitable for, you know, they only had like a couple steps, procedures, and it was suitable for the process. In other operating procedures, I've seen interlinking operating procedures. Um, let's say, for example, emergency shutdown. You may have a set of operating procedures that may require to look at other um, equipment shutdowns. For example, in an emergency shutdown procedure, you may have it reference 
a shutdown procedure for your compressors, a shutdown procedure for your condensers. Um, so it really, it is really dependent on how complicated your process is. Um, also, concerning emergency shutdown, it, it, it's dependent on, uh, I guess, the condition, the scenario that you have to shut down. Do you have a leak on the high side of the uh, of your system, low side, um, or do you have to do an overall shutdown? It is on the operator to determine what tasks are necessary that need to be in your operating procedures and to provide appropriate detail as well to be able to um, conduct these activities. Uh, operating procedures need to discuss operating limits. Concerning operating limits, this provides an operator to know what is considered normal conditions within your process. At the same time, it provides what's a deviation. Is there a hazard present when there is a temperature above a certain level? Is there a, a hazard when it's below a certain pressure? This is also tied in with the safety, um, the safety, uh, function, safety, safety systems and functions, which I'll discuss uh, in a little bit. A discussion on safety and health considerations. So when you're in your operating procedures for certain activities, do you need certain PPE to work with the equipment? Um, concerning the hazard, um, if I am sprayed with a certain chemical, do I go to my water uh, eye wash station and wash it out? Or is the chemical water reactive? Your operators need to know what this information is and the hazards associated with it. Um, or if there's any special equipment needed for a certain process or activity. Uh, safety systems and their functions. So as I was discussing earlier about operating limits, do you have operating limits that trigger out uh, certain alarms? Your oper operators need to know what these alarms mean. Um, you know, dependent on, let's say, if you have a, I think they call it like a tree light alarm, where they have certain colors that distinguish certain uh, parts per million levels. What does that mean? You know, does it mean that, oh, there's, uh, there's an issue with the system? Does it mean that I need to do a full evacuation? So these are some of the discussions that need to be incorporated into the operating procedures. Uh, additional requirements, uh, operating procedures should be readily accessible to employees. Some of the ways that I've seen this done is I've seen companies uh, utilize a network system, uh, a computer-based network system where they can you know, go in, log in, and access the SOPs. Uh, the question I pose to my operators is, if that network fails, do you have a hard copy to be able to reference? And at the same time, I do pose another question that do you update both copies? You know, if you update something on your network, do you update the hard copies as well? So that's something to ask your operator to ask your operators. Um, additional requirements is SOPs uh, need to be reviewed annually and cer certified current and correct. Uh, between program two and program three, uh, program three requires this annual certification, while in program two, it does need to be um, uh, reviewed and updated when necessary. Um, that's the major difference between program two and program three. Um, and then lastly is developing uh, uh, safe work practices. Uh, these safe work practices are, let's say, confined space, uh, lockout, tagout. So within your operating procedures, these discussions need to be incorporated um, when a procedure or activity uh, requires these practices to be conducted. Um, I reference uh, the Center of Chemical Process Safety on, uh, on various things. It's, um, they provide various uh, uh, references or material on developing process safety management and risk management plan programs and um, you know, to further understand the program itself. Um, but some of the recommendations that I thought were really good on how to inspect and audit a program 
uh, is um, you know, review operating procedures, review what the operating procedures say, and talk, with the uh, talk to the operator and see if that uh, aligns. Um, check works, safe work practices um, and see if those permits are being pulled for those specific procedures. Um, so these are just some examples that you can do when auditing or inspecting a program. Uh, this is also from CCPS. Uh, one of the things that is complicated about the CalArt PSM program is that when there is a change in one element, it can be interrelated to the change, changes in uh, many other elements. That's what makes the CalArp and PSM program, I guess, a beast of a program. Um, there is specifically a element just for these changes, which is known as management of change, which I'll discuss later. But this just gives you an idea of some of the primary uh, relationships that uh, each element can have on, e on each other. So I want to relate a story on uh, SOPs during one of my inspections. Uh, I requested documentation for uh, emergency shutdown procedures, or SOPs in general. And one of the things that I questioned about their SOPs was based on their complexity of their process for their <coughs> shutdown. Um, the steps that they provided was, we push this button to shut down the system. And the question I posed to them is, if this button fails, what do you do in that case? And um, in further reviewing documentation, um, in their tra training records, I saw that they did have a detailed plan on uh, emergency shutdown by utilizing their other equipment, SOPs. And um, that is one thing that I, I saw that um, in relation with training and SOPs, um, that there wasn't any uh, congruency between the two. So I did recommend, hey, your SOPs need to be updated to, um, to, uh, to deal with issues when your emergency button fails, where you have a manual uh, set of procedures to be able to reference. So that's one example with uh, SOPs and relating with training. Uh, next element is training. So training has to be done every initial and every three years. Uh, training needs to consist of overview of the process. What is the process chemical, um, you know, do, and how does it go throughout the throughout it, the system? Um, we just discussed operating procedures, um, specific safety and health hazards emergency operations, what do we do when we need to evacuate, is there certain safety systems that are in place, uh, and safe work practices. Again, lockout, tag out, confined space. So these are the uh, uh, essentials for training at the bare minimum. Uh, when inspecting and auditing a training program, I would review what's on their training program what is the frequency in which they train? Again, it does say that at the bare minimum, three years. But if the program can say, hey, we do more often than that, then that's something that you have to t take a look into and make, making sure that that is being followed. Um, all the employees that are part of the process being trained, that's something that you need to look into. Uh, uh, in, um, interviewing, talking to the operators and see if they do have the competency. Um, with a, uh, in one of my inspections concerning training, uh, me and Mark went to a facility to follow up on a tampering of a, uh, uh, al an alarm. And as we were discussing <coughs> with the operator, we did some other observations uh, within the machinery room. Machinery room. Um, we can tell like there's uh, something leaking from one of the compressors, and that was definitely you know one of the, an issue, especially with the alarm sensor being uh, tampered. Uh, but during at the same time, uh, while we're talking with the operator, we observed a employee going to each screen, you know, taking jotting down notes, and we pulled him aside and 
asked him, hey, you know, what are you, what are you doing? What are you taking down? And essentially, he was just going through and uh, taking down temperatures and pressures, things like that. And uh, what we found out that was that, um, or we further asked him, you know, certain questions about, you know, if he was formally trained and, um, yeah, for the most part, he wasn't. He was uh, essentially starting out and still, you know, learning um, uh, his job. So that was something that, you know, through interviewing and, um, you know, we found out that that was a deficiency within their program. Uh, next element is the mechanical integrity. Uh, mechanical integrity uh, between program, difference between program two and three. Um, program two is known as maintenance. Program three is known as uh, mechanical integrity. Essentially, it is the program that ensures that the system is working appropriately and is maintained, essentially. Uh, so within a mechanical integrity program, there's a list of equipment that should be listed on what needs to be maintained. And from that, the maintenance should be dependent on uh, RAGAGEP, recognized and generally good engineering practices, or uh, based on uh, manufacturer recommendations. Based on those, uh, based on the RAGAGEP developed list, um, there are various subcomponents, various subcomponents uh, that need to be prepared. Everything from written procedures on how to maintain, maintain the process, um, essential training to conduct maintenance, such as, again, safe work practices, inspection and testing, what are the frequencies for inspecting and for testing, um, quality assurance. Um, this is notable in program three, uh, making sure that if there's any like spare parts, um, ensuring that those spare parts are compatible with the system. And then of course, correcting equipment deficiencies um, and um, you know, documenting that they've been uh, corrected. Uh, these are just some examples of equipment to consider. Uh, um, pumps, compressors, pressure vessels, storage tanks, um, you know, emergency shutdowns. Uh, Ragged get standards to consider. Um, again, there's a, uh, depending on your process, you will refer to uh, utilize potentially one of these standards or multiple standards. You know, API, American Petroleum Institute, IIAR, International Institute of Ammonia Refrigeration. Uh, types of inspections and testings. These are just some examples. Um, I should have put, uh, you know, like for, pipe, for inspecting piping, um, non-destructive testing, um, things like that as well. Uh, inspecting, auditing, mechanical integrity, uh, review mechanical integrity program, see what's on their program, what equipment, what's, what is on their equipment list, um, see what frequencies they should be um, performing those inspections and tests, um, and then compare it to also like, you know, on-site, on-site equipment. Um, uh, so primary interfacing elements, with the mechanical integri integrity program, uh, with one of my inspections, um, I was doing a cold storage ammonia uh, facility, and one of the main things that I look for as soon as I get into a machinery room is I look at the anchorage and support of piping and and uh, electrical. That's the first thing I just you know just one of my uh, things that catch my eye. So I'm looking at the piping, I'm looking at the electrical, and I see that the, it's consistently being anchored by a certain, um, um, well, they're all consistent with each other, except for this one spot where I see pipe, piping, or a, it was actually an electrical conduit um, being held by this messy looking wire um, that really bugged, you know, bugged my eye. And um, <coughs> essentially, I, I called them out on that, that this, is, this isn't uh, appropriate for this system. I mean, you have uh, proper anchorage everywhere else, but here you have just this messy little wire dangling. 
And in, in, case, in cases of an earthquake, you know, that wire is going to fail. I mean, it's not, it's not if, it's when. So that was something that they had uh, deficiency on. In relation to the mechanical integrity program, um, yeah, that that is definitely uh, you know could be related to like the MOC, you know, <laughs> with that change, or actually with the quality assurance side of the mechanical integrity program. Is was that even built for that system? So um, yeah, that didn't cut it. Uh, next is management of change, uh, MOCs. Essentially, the management of change is a, I guess you could say, like a thought process of determining if a change has uh, affected any of the other elements uh, within your CalArt program, and does it introduce any other uh, hazards um, to the process. Uh, so minimum considerations to be addressed within a management of change, um, the technical basis for the proposed change, impact of change in the safety and health, modifications to and or development of new operating, operating and maintenance procedures, necess necessary time period for the change, and authorization requirements for, for the proposed change. So with that being discussed, here are some, a couple scenarios that I, I brought up on, um, with uh, MOCs. So if your if a facility goes from an underground piping to a above ground piping or vice versa does this constitute a management of change yes. i bring this specific situation up because this happened to me doing one of my inspections of a uh, it was a bullet tank uh, with i think propane or butane and as i was discussing with the operator um, about the, their system he brought up how oh, we changed the, the low ground piping to the above ground piping to avoid uh, corrosion of the piping. And <coughs> I asked him, was there an MOC done for this change? And he told me, oh, it's a replacement in kind. You know, we're just going from below to above ground. And I discussed with him that, well, even if in that case, um, you know, it's, you're still just changing the piping, you're changing the environment that that piping is in. Yes, you're avoiding corrosion, um, but now you potentially could introduce a new hazard. And one of the things that I, messed, I talked to him was, did you ever consider of um, where the piping is located? Are you next to vehicular traffic? So that was the question. Do you have the appropriate protection to protect that piping? So in that case, yes, they, they did need to, to do an MOC. Um, uh, scenario two, pressure relief valve change out from valve company A to valve company uh, B. Um, this is, really depends. Um, it depends on your mechanical integrity program. If you authorize a, um, for valve com company B and A to, um, you know, that it's compatible with your system, then it's fine. But if you, ha if you don't have that within your program, then you have to, go through the MOC process to determine that <coughs> valve company B is compatible. So, uh, so um, yeah, just some examples on, on um, how to inspect and audit a management of change program. Uh, Pre-startup safety review. Pre-startup safety review is essentially a, before you start your process, especially for newer processes uh, that are starting out, um, it is a list of um, checks that you have to perform before you can, you know, insert the chemical into the, into the process or to start up your process. Um, this includes making sure that everything's con uh, made uh, to specification with the system, making sure that if there's any open uh, uh, issues or findings within the PHA that that is resolved, and then um, um, making sure that all operating procedures are developed for that system, and uh, that training has been done for maintenance and um, uh, operators. Uh, inspecting, auditing, pre-startup safety reviews, 
Uh, these are just some examples uh, that you can utilize. Uh, primary inter interfacing elements, uh, you know, with a PSSR, again, it's related to training, making sure training is done for your operators before a system starts, making sure that based on the PSI, making sure that it's compatible um, with SOPs, making sure you have SOPs available for any, anything new uh, that's been incorporated into the system. Um, compliance audits, um, what Mark was saying earlier about the uh, inspecting and compliance audits. Um, essentially, a compliance audit is uh, reviewing your program elements, making sure that you're verifying that um, that the process meets those requirements uh, based on your program. And that's done every three years. Uh, this chart, I created this chart um, for both inspecting and for compliance audits because it's what I would like to say my thought process when I do an inspection. Um, usually I would like to go through the program, um, you know, look through the, a facility's program and then check, you know, compared to regulation. Um, from there, from regulation to RAGAGEP, does it meet those minimum requirements? Um, from that, the program to on-site conditions. Um, with on-site conditions, you know, uh, with their employees, um, you know, do they, uh, with employees, documentation, uh, and equipment. So this is just essentially like my thought process of how I would conduct my inspections. It's essentially, um, you know, uh, very similar to compliance audits. So, um, uh, just highlighted requirements, compliance audits need to be performed every three years. Um, they have to be knowledgeable with the process and then based on the findings, they have to be uh, uh, a timetable of corrective actions uh, need to be uh, agreed upon with the COOPA or at the bare minimum uh, 1.5 years. And then two of the most recent compliance audits need to be um, retained. Uh, some examples on uh, reviewing compliance audits. Um, one of the things with the compliance audits, um, you know, checking for dates when their last compliance audit was done. And one of my inspections, you know, I found that they were late, so I, I made them perform their compliance audit and. Even during that compliance audit, I found multiple deficiencies in their emergency response notifications. Um, so one specifically just talking about uh, ammonia. Uh, they were referencing the federal, um, just reporting the 100 pounds for a release. Um, and I had them also incorporate a, a notification to the COOPA for any significant or unplanned um, accidental release as well to be incorporated into their um, documentation. Uh, incident investigations. Uh, incident investigations is pretty much, you know, when there's an incident occurred, um, it's providing the, the root causes of what happened to that incident and what needs to be done to prevent that incident from reoccurring. Uh, here I provided some of the requirements of a, you know, a start to finish of a incident. Um, when an incident occurs, you do need to provide 48 hours um, or you need to conduct and uh, initiate a incident investigation within 48 hours. Um, when you conduct a incident, incident investigation, you have to have a team that is uh, knowledgeable with the process um, and then include anybody that's applicable to the process where the incident occurred. Um, this can include engineers, operators, um, contractors, and then the uh, timetable is very similar to, for corrective ac action, it's very similar to the compliance audit, um, it's 1.5 years um, after the incident investigation or two years after the incident. Uh, basic requirements for incident investigation reports, data investigation, description of the incident, essentially you know, how much was released, environment, environmental conditions, uh, weather conditions, and then any re recommendations resulting from the investigation. Uh, additional requirements, uh, Retaining investigation reports for five years. The reports must be reviewed with all affected employees. Um, documentation of resolutions and corrective actions with completion dates. Uh, some approaches to inspecting and auditing incident investigations. Um, you know, making sure one of the, I think the most uh,
common one that I utilize is just making sure that the corrective actions have been completed. Um, and then uh, primary inter interfacing elements with inc inc incident investigation. And that's it. Uh, so next is Dan Starkey. <coughs> Good morning. <clears throat> Pardon me. Good morning. Um, does anybody have any questions before I before I get started? Okay, that's good because I'm gonna come down here. Can you hear me? There we go. <clears throat> so my uh, my talk or what I want to talk about today is is emergency response, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, how to do graduated enforcement. And I don't know if, show of hands of who in here is a um, industry person, industry? Okay, so we got quite a few. Regulators, the rest, anybody else who's other than that? So normally we don't talk about our cases in these types of settings, but I'm gonna talk about a, a case that we did because it relates to emergency response and also graduated enforcement. So it's a little more than that. And I have, I have a few slides I'm gonna go through, but if you've been to any of the other uh, CalArp classes, they kind of went through these as well. And so I, I sat through the class and I thought, you know, do I wanna just talk about the exact same thing? No, no, no. So last night I, I made some changes to my presentation and we'll, we'll kind of go from there. So everybody, everybody probably has a good idea what an emergency response is. It's responding to something from an outside area where there was actually a, a release or um, a likely release. Um, the interesting thing about emergency response is all facilities have a choice. You can either decide to be a responding facility or a non-responding facility. And I'll bet if I ask or raise of hands how many are responding facilities, there's not a, more than a couple of hands that, that are raised. And um, the reason for that is there's an expense, there's training, there's a lot of things that go along with that. So a lot of facilities just basically rely on, um, on uh, the local fire department and also the local um, Coupa or whoever else they would have, maybe a contractor that would respond to their facility. So if you're a non-responding facility, you have to either coordinate with, with the local county hazardous materials um, area plan or business plan or something, but there has to be coordination. Um, and, uh, and for flammables, it's basically the, the, the same thing. Um, and the, the coordination is that, um, in, oh, in, in part of the coordination, you have to have written procedures that are in place to notify responders and do those, do those things that you would normally do in an emergency response, um, even though you're not responding. And um, for responding facilities, you know, and, and in the regulations, when it says shall, it, what it really means is you must do it, according to us. It means you must. So, again, you have that, you have that choice, and really the only, the only facilities that no longer have a choice are refineries. Program four facilities are required to have an emergency response program. They don't have a choice. Um, this right here is, a, is an incident that happened in, in our county. Um, and basically, the reason why I put it in there because it was a response where everybody was there. Fire was there, the facility our response people were there, and, and we were there as environmental health. So just showing that there was um, coordination and, and actual, um, you know, we, we all worked together in the incident command system. Um, and this goes back to what I said. For example, in our county, we have about 175 facilities that we deal with. And out of those 175 facilities, I, I, I think I counted eight, and maybe there's six now, but uh, about 4% of our facilities actually respond. And we have refineries and, and chemical facilities, gas plants, we have tons of stuff. And um, there's, a, there's just not a lot of facilities out there that are willing to do that. Um, and if you're a responding facility, there's a lot more things you have to do. There, you, have to, you have to have the procedures for inter interfacing with the public. You have to have documentation of your, or for your, of your chemicals and how those things are actually um, 
uh, I mean, a lot of times what I see is the information is sent with the people that are contaminated to the hospital, so the, uh, the emergency peer personnel will know how to treat those, those types of things, exposures. And, um, and then the other thing is you have to have the procedures and measures for actually responding to the, to the incident. And uh, again, those are things that are, that are costly, you have to update. Um, you have to you have to have your your equipment. You have to um, yeah, yeah. You, there's the testing and the, of, of the for example, if if you have uh, combustible gas and you have the CGI, you have the monitoring, you have the suits, you have all those things that go into emergency response. Then on top of that, you have to do the training, and uh, and part of that training is also that you have to do drills because if you don't ever practice what you're going to do, you'll never do it right, and. Um, and then you also have to update your plan and make sure that uh, when you've made changes to your facility, your employees understand and know that. So this is the part where I'm gonna kind of try to combine the two. So this is new, so don't hold me to all the accuracy. I hope there's even, I hope it's spelled correctly, to tell you the truth. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is a facility in our county that has acrolein, and they actually manufacture acrolein. Acrolein has an IDLH of two parts per million. So if you get a little bit out of the, out of the containment, you have a big problem. And um, so th this facility, um, and I'll just say it, it is actually a very well-run facility. It's, it, they do a good job. They, um, they are very competent. Their employees are trained. And you know it's one of those things where, where they're good. And a few years ago, they, they had an incident where we um, did an administrative enforcement order. And I believe um, after meeting with them and talking with them, we, we dropped the fines down to like 10,000. I think they were up around 100. So we dropped them down to 10. And, um, and then after that, we had, uh, had a, or they, they had about three more incidents at their facility regarding the same chemical. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, this is the facility, and if you, if you look at it, it's very complicated, it looks like a refinery, um, has a lot of uh, different process type of components, and um, has uh, uh, some, some storage and some other areas. But I'm gonna basically talk about this facility here. This, um, this facility is a, is a, uh, tower type process and they have a bunch of columns like a refinery would and they're, and they're progressively refining this chemical until it gets to a certain point. And um, the first incident that happened, they, um, there was a contractor doing some maintenance and they have, like I said, they're a good facility, they have SOPs, they have all these things for everything that they do. And during this, this incident, they were going to um, remove a stinger from a certain portion of the column, they were up on the sixth floor and because they, um, they hadn't really, um, dis or to actually remove a flange, they had to, to step back and go to another area and remove some stuff. They'd already purged and done all this stuff. But because they expanded the scope of what they were trying to do, um, they went ahead and did it without doing an MOC, without, um, without repurging the system or doing anything like that. And so when they opened the system up, their employees were exposed. Two contract employees were exposed. And the, the worst part was that the, the employees weren't wearing the proper PPE because they thought they had cleaned the system and it was good and they didn't have to put all that stuff on and it was hot. So that would be, that would be the first one. Um, and then the second one happened uh, kind of in, in the evening at the facility. And this was due to some maintenance issues where the, the facility had um, changed some, some flanges on some uh, strainers and the, the, the strainers were specific and they had very specific SOPs on how they were supposed to do that. Once, once they, re, they replaced them, they were supposed to check that the, they were supposed to pressure them up with air before they, before they applied the chemical. And very specifically, they were supposed to pressure them up to 100 PSI. And when we got there and, um, and did, did our investigation, we found that the gauges were almost unreadable and that they had actually pressured it up to 40 PSI. And so when they went ahead and put the system back online, up to 100, blew the gasket, and there was an exposure. 
There were only two employees at the facility at that time, two operators. And to let you know, this is a non-responding facility. They, they are sort of a, a hybrid in the fact that they have SCBAs and they have suits, but that's basically for maintenance type operations, not for emergency response. And um, so what I, what I kind of would like to do is just, just get into <clears throat> some of the actual violations. So I pulled these out of our administrative enforcement order, so, and, I, and I hope they're, uh, they're readable and manageable. But um, one of the things that, that we do as an agency is if you have a, a release, then we are going to do an investigation. Whether you do one or not, we're still going to do one. And, um, and so we, we basically came, took a look, and we realized that uh, a, after, the, to, after the whole thing was said and done, they, re, or they reported the incident to us approximately two hours after it had happened. And so we, we, um, we included that in the administrative enforcement order because you're required to notify us within 15 minutes or basically as quickly as you possibly can. And, and in this instance, there, were, um, there was plenty of, of opportunity. This, was the, this one here was, the, was the, uh, a, a, fine, or a, a penalty from the first incident. And then um, we held a meeting and kind of went over some of the things to, to talk about it. And um, the, the import, we told, talked to them about the proper communication and doing those types of things. And the agency said to us that we have SOPs the only problem is that we failed to follow them. And that typically is, is something that you see quite a bit. So they had, they, had, um, they had SOPs for who to notify, when to notify, um, how to notify, and they just didn't do it. And so we did that. And then so one, one of the other issues was they failed to do a management of change. And the reason why is because midstream of the process, or, or the process they decided to change or they had to change the scope of it. And because of that, they didn't, um, they didn't go back and redo their line break procedures. And so again, they didn't follow what they were supposed to do. Um, now in the, in the second incident, um, th this is where their um, operating procedures were just not followed again. They, they failed to follow operating procedures by changing the, the or by not pressuring the, the, the um, the strainers to the proper thing, and then the, the flange leak exposed contractors. Um, no. And then prior to this one, the week before, they were doing maintenance and they had, they had a, a flange leak. And, and in, when we took a look at that, what they had done is just put the wrong flange in, the wrong flange material, and it, and it didn't hold. So they were sort of building, or we were sort of building the, the fact that, that um, that they were just having issues. And I don't know if it was with their contractor or just uh, trying to, um, you know, trying to cut corners. This, this company at that time was, was up for sale and so a lot of employees left. And so it was, a, it was a time when some of their most experienced people had already taken off. And that, that happens a lot in businesses where there's um, uncertainty about who's gonna have a job and who's not gonna have a job. And if you have a chance to leave and get something else, then you do. And that's kind of what happened here. Um, but, S, but the SOPs uh, for both releases show that the, their facilities failure to follow them um, and, and by not installing the, uh, the equipment properly. Um, and in, in this one, I'm just going to read this. Operators shall correct deficiencies in equipment that are outside acceptable limits before use in a safe, um, use in a timely manner when used, when necessary means are taken to assure safe operation. And then what we said was the facility failed to replace the um, illegible gauges to the strainer because, and I'm pr we're pretty sure that that's the reason why they didn't know how much they pressured it up to until they looked at their gauge in the, in the operating room, that, that, that it only pressured it up to 40 PSI. Um, and then we also really went after them for their failure to follow their emergency response procedures. And the, the, the reason is because there were only two operators on site. They had an issue. One operator went out and um, became exposed. And the sec second operator was, was required by their, their stuff to stay in the, 
to stay in the control room, make notifications, and get people coming. But what he did is he panicked, and he ran out and tried to help the other guy. Luckily, he put an SCBA on, or he would have been exposed too. And, um, and then the, the, the procedures for interfacing with the public and the local emergency response agencies, the facility failed to notify um, or failed to follow their, and this is where they are, their, emerg their emergency action plan. The operators didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, and then this is, just, this is just a regulation that talks about for a stationary source who's, who's not going to, um, who's not going to respond to an incident, what they're supposed to do. And if you think about it, they, they're, like I said, they're kind of a hybrid, so they kind of responded, but they thought they were responding to a maintenance issue. But when you have a chemical, a high, highly toxic chemical like that, just a little bit of a release is going to be a problem for you. Um, and in their emergency response plan, one of the things that happens or one of the things they're supposed to do and they're trained on is in the facility, if they have a release, they have emergency showers all over the place. And when you hit the emergency shower, it does all kinds of things. It sets off an alarm. People start evacuating. And, and it's, there's a whole series of things that cascade when that happens. And these guys didn't do that either. They went and found a hose. They, they were trying to get around the, the system. And for, for, for this facility, um, for us, we, we ended up fining them around $100,000 $100, for these processes. And so what happened was the, the first fine was around 10,000 and the second one was around 90. And that was negotiated down from, from quite a lot. It was quite a lot more than that initially. But uh, part of the AEO um, that, that we think is important that a lot of people don't really, I don't think they really look at when they're, when they're dealing with emergency response and those types of things. Again, if a, if a facility's not drilling even if they're not drilling their emergency action plan, if they're not practicing and doing that kind of stuff, then I can tell you when it actually happens, they're not gonna follow it. They're gonna do whatever they think is, is appropriate at the time. Um, and so what we required on this is we required them to do an emergency response with us and fire and some other agencies. And, um, and by doing that, we made them also use, use the, the incidents that they had where we, they had to rescue people and do certain things. Um, so to, to kind of move on just a little further, um, to talk about graduated en en enforcement that, that we do. Um, this is, the, this is the, the section that gives us the authority to, uh, to actually en enforce the regulations. And there's, as of January 1st of this year, the fines used to be um, not less than 2,000, now it's not less than 5,000. And then the other change is that any stationary source used to say knowingly, and they removed that knowingly part for, um, so it would be after reasonable notice of violation, then the, then the fines uh, will go up to $25,000 per day. Um, the reason that I think you should do, as a, as a county agency, why you should do enforcement, and I. You know, one of the things that, that, um, that I think that their perception is if you do enforcement, um, people are going to step back and they're not going to really want to have anything to do with you. They're going to try to hide stuff. And we find that to be just the opposite. That by doing enforcement, but also having a lot of communication, um, things actually improve. So enforcement is, is a deterrence and it helps achieve compliance. And then the other, the other thing that, that, that you need to do is every, every local agency should have an emergency um, uh, or an enforcement policy along with your inspection policy. And if you follow that and you do what you're supposed to do, then the graduated enforcement would be, it would be um, reasonable because you would have given them chances and helped them along the way and try, uh, tried to allow them to come into compliance without, without having to do um, anything more than that. Um, now to talk about graduate enforcement's where to start. For example, violations not corrected in the time frame are a problem. Minor violations um, not corrected in 30 days turn into class two violations. And uh, other violations you can specify the, the, the times. Um, for example, my, the other, my other coworkers had, had talked about uh, the PHA. 
And, and if you look, it says timetable agreed upon with the, with the Koopa or UPA or two and a half years. Well, for us, it's always been a year. We've always followed that policy until this came along. And because you're supposed to do communication, we, we still follow the year unless, they, unless there's some reason why um, the, the, that we wouldn't do that. For example, if there was some major um, components or changes to the facility that cost a lot of money that needed, you know, needed some time, we'd be perfectly fine with that. Um, I got five minutes? Ooh, okay. Um, so uh, compliance audit, the same thing. Um, that says the owner operator shall enter into an agreement with the UPA on a timetable for resolutions of these findings. Um, and they give you 1.5 years, but uh, we typically don't, you know, we, we do it within a year or maybe even sooner. Um, again, this kind of goes over the, the, violation, the class violations. Um, and then here are some examples, and this, these, these have already been gone over, and it's in literature and it's available to you. Um, reported gallons instead of pounds, that's, that would be considered a minor violation. Um, example two, uh, RMP update was, not, was submitted late. Now, that, I, I kind of have an issue with this, because if you're a federal facility, you're notified six months in advance by EPA that you have to redo your RMP. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but facilities know that. And um, so you've already so you've already been notified. And for us, we notify you a couple of a couple of months in advance through email. And so we have documentation that we did it. So if you don't submit, then you're you're going to get a two thousand dollar fine minimum. And if you if you've done it before, then um, then you'll get you'll get a little bit more. Um, and then uh, class one violations. Um, no incident investigation conducted for a significant release. I would think that's a class one. And, again, and there, there's a bunch that are in the documentation and um, don't really need to go, th go through all those at this time. Um, and so I, I threw this up to kind of show how we as a COOPA decide to go through and, and, and look at, at, uh, at violations. And for most of the other programs, you've got 30 days to do something. But for, um, for CalARP, it's different. And so in our inspection reports, when we're doing things and we note violations, some violations are 30 to 60 days, some are 60 to 90, some are six months, some are a year, and then some are even maybe longer than the other ones depending on when the turnaround's gonna be or what you have to do, the cost and those types of things. Uh, also, also depends on um, the, the risk to, to employees and to the outside population. If, if there were some things that needed to be done a little quicker, we, we would push for that. Um, and th this, this is, these are just the kind of the continuations, and th those will be in the slides. So, and just to kind of talk about, over the last three years, and like I said, we, we do enforce the, the submit, oper um, submit violation. The last three years, we've collected that much money on, on people failing to submit their, their RMP. And then for prevention violations, we've collected about 230,000. So we do enforcement. But I think if you, if you were to talk to, to our facilities, we have good relationships with them. We do inspections every year, not every three years. So tend to know them very well. And um, uh, I, think that's, I think that's all I have. So if there's any questions. Yeah. We, we, we do, and we do them, you know, we, we tend to follow Contra Costa County in a lot of ways, and, and, uh, and we, we looked at what they do in their audits, and we tried to follow them. We simplified it a little bit, but we send out notification that we're coming, who's on the audit team, what we're going to audit, um, set up a date, and do that kind of stuff. So we do a formal audit if we're going to do an audit, and we do, do, we do some. Not, not a lot, but we do some. And typically we'll pick a facility that's either had problems or um, we, th we think might be having issues. We try to do it that way. Okay. Oh. Just go. So a number of you have, we've got a couple minutes left and we'll, so we'll try and answer um, some of your questions that you've submitted. So appreciate Appreciate that. Uh, let's go here again. If anybody wants to ask, and I'll give the microphone up. <clears throat> um, 
And so, yeah, we'll just kind of run through. I, I'll do a couple on the top, but if you want, actually, Dad, if you want to keep the microphone, we can pass it and a couple of you guys can answer as well. Um, what does RAGAGEP stand for? Um, recognized and generally accepted good engineering practice. So in the CALIP regulation, it says in a number of places that um, <clears throat> facilities are required to do things in accordance with RAGAGEP. That is going to differ depending on the industry and depending on the regulated chemical or the regulated substance. So if it's ammonia, there's documents like IIR. Um, if it's refineries, you've got API. Um, if you've got other cylinders, you've got CGA. So RAGAGEP can be different for different industries. Um, I appreciate this question, so whoever asked, thank you. Uh, is it a conflict of interest for resource compliance as pi private industry to, to be presenting and working so closely with Kern County? Um, or is I can answer that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or is okay. resource compliance now part of Coupa? No, I am not part of Coupa. The reason why I'm here is we recognize, I mean, you can answer if you want to, uh, Kern County, um, I do actually a lot of work in Kern County, and so we actually work closely in that sense where they're in um, inspecting facilities that I've consulted with um, for the purpose of this presentation, recognizing that both regulatory um, CUPAs and industry are present in the audience. Um, they requested that we represent in, pre in presenters both the perspective of um, private industry and CUPA as well. So we just wanted to represent both sides because there's both sides of you in the audience is the reason. And, and just on another note, we find them before. So yes, <laughs> so there's no yeah there there's no hey you present with us then we'll go easy on you sort of thing that doesn't happen um, at all. So uh, what are your thoughts on SO2 distribution centers where the cylinders are co-located? Their argument is that uh, only one cylinder would break and should not be considered connected. So they argue no CalArp application. I just want to, I'll just throw this up there again if you go to the guidance document. Um, it defines what process actually means. So just because the, the cylinders are not connected, um, but if they're co-located, that's still the language that is used. So if you have cylinders that are co-located, then you have to um, add up the, the amount of the regulated substance in the co-located cylinders or vessels, and then if that is over the threshold, then you, um, then CalArp applies to you. So just because they're not connected, if someone's making an argument, hey, I have two cylinders that are next to, that are next to each other, but they're not connected, therefore um, it doesn't apply, that's a misinterpretation and a misunderstanding of process. In that instance, the best thing to be would, would, would be only keep one cylinder there and move the other one to a different storage location so you're under the there you go. threshold quantity. <clears throat> what? So like one of the questions that I would have for that with a co-location is if there's a fire that occurs within that location, now all the cylinders are affected <clears throat> given that instance. Mm, potentially, yeah. So there's, there's a number of factors to consider, but specifically if someone's making the argument that they're not connected, therefore it doesn't count, um, misunderstanding. Uh, did you say that Calocha universally enforces hot work permitting for businesses at any level or process? So if I imply that it's universal application, that's not necessarily the case, but Cal OSHA in Title VIII does have their own hot work permit regulation. Um, there are certain exemptions there, so you can read that for yourself. But in general, if you're doing grinding, welding, cutting, um, hot work is going to apply, but there are certain exemptions. You can read that for yourself. Um, if we have a question, do we contact resource compliance or environmental health? Whoever you want. <laughs> yeah, if it's regulatory, probably environmental health. If it's yeah. help with your, with your facility or system, I would contact resource compliance. Or another consultant, so I'm not getting yeah. paid to do the well, same thing. If, you don't so. want to, if it's bad and you don't want us to know, then contact them. Yes. How's that? <laughs> um, as an inspector, I'll leave that one to you. How would you approach deficiencies for a program level two facility implementing a program level three program? So. Well, um, I think the bottom line is, is you have to, whatever you decide you're going to do, that's what's enforceable. In other words, if your programs are program two, but you say you're gonna do MOC, or you're going to do mechanical in integrity instead of um, instead of maintenance, then that's what we'll hold you to because that's what you said you were going to do. And uh, basically, it's your program. But if you decide to upgrade, 
you know, that's, I, I think if you have, you know, if you have the documentation that says that's what you're going to do and you, and then you don't do it, then I think you could be held accountable for it. And this is where we talk. So yeah, regulator consultant. So in your program two, this is where you write your policies according to program two. But if something like a change comes up, then you can um, follow MOC kind of things, but that's not in your written policy, so you're not being held to it, but you still implement it as a best practice. See, that's contractor speak or exactly. consultant speak. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Uh, would a worst case release scenario with a distance to a toxic endpoint extending off the facility property but not reaching public or environmental receptors be considered program level one or two? It all depends. Um, for example, a lot of people don't know that uh, recreational areas, farm areas, and those types of things would be considered off-site. So if you, I mean, one of the facilities in our county, which is um, Elk Hills Naval Petroleum Reserve, they have like five or six covered processes, but they own the whole hill. They own 25 square miles. And because their facility is in the middle, they're a program one, and they have tons of stuff. So it just, it just depends. If you really don't have any receptors, then you're a program one. That's, I mean, that's kind of the bottom line, but you have to understand what the, what the definition of receptor is, and it's not just public and residents. It's if people could be in a location that you have no control over. And the, the other issue is that facility, Elk Hills, would be a program three, except for the fact that they have gated entrances and they have security. So they have a way to assure that anybody that's on their property is, is, is uh, listed and known and, and on, their, um, on their inventory. Okay. I got two minutes left and we got a couple more questions. So Go. I'm trying to run through it. Um, interesting one. So if you have two locations of ammonia, at the same facility, both under 500 pounds, but 25 feet away from each other. How do I prove that these locations are one or not one process and regulated by a CalArt program? Again, this talks with like co-location sort of stuff. I think arguments can be made. We'd have to look at your specific um, process and talk with your regulator. Um, things such as like automatic shutdowns um, could help in that determination because the question is, if the release of, does the release of one affect the release of another? Um, so in this instance, 25 feet isn't very far. If your compressor yeah. blew up, could some shrapnel hit the other one? Possibly. <laughs> I'd say yeah. you're close enough. But if it was 100 feet, then I'd say maybe. What are program four requirements? We're not going to be talking about program four. Whole another class. Talk yep. to this Pro guy. Program four. There, yeah. There's really no training at this at this conference for program four. The only training that that we have received is is either through through Cal OSHA. Um, and, and that process or going and getting it ourselves, paying the, the county paying for us to go like back to Knoxville to get training. So that's really the only, the only option at this point. I think, the, I think at the future conf conferences, they're, they're gonna plan on including a program four element and have some people come in and, and present. Mm, but like even, I mean, Contra Costa is, is, the, is the county that actually does that most of that. And, and um, those guys have been trained with their uh, industrial ordinance, and they've been doing it for a while, so we've all kind of piggybacked on a lot of their knowledge, but no training right now. We are out of time, but if you asked a couple questions, there's a couple more that didn't get to this. Um, I know you got other classes to be to. Some, one of them was, does Kern County require seismic assessments right now? Um, yes. Yes. Well, okay. Mm. They're moving that direction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, okay, right. thank you for your time and hope this has been helpful. If we didn't get to your question, we'll be around um, to...